fantastic. And welcome to a Speak for Yourself debate. Uh, we are here to find out who has the strongest way with words, who is the most passionate in defence of a particular stance, and who can sway our audience and our judge in our midst. And today we've actually got three different perspectives. Let me introduce to you on my right, this is Ben from Birmingham. He is going to be speaking for our proposition. Sitting next to him is Tando. Tando is from Walsall, and she's going to be sitting on the fence by arguing that maybe yes, and maybe no. Whereas Amy from Coventry is going to say never, totally against it. And the proposition we're here to discuss is, is violence sometimes justified? Is violence sometimes justified? I'm guessing there are a few thoughts and comments. We'll be coming to the audience very soon for that. But let's start by welcoming Ben to the front and tell us why, Ben, you are for this proposition. I'm for this proposition because the only way to fight violence with violence, violence is necessary to the stopping and prevention of violence. If we can't use means of cyber activity or cyber inactivity to determine when violence is going to occur and take place, we need semi-violent protocols in place so we can take out anyone who has intents of committing violence. Um, if you look at the um, fil uh, film with Tom Cruise, um, I forget what it's called, but um, there's a whole pre-crime division um, using the extremes of mass violence to um, predetermine and inhibit violence. So violence is necessary and uh, meted out with extreme care only for the consequence of violence. Okay, thank you very much. A very strong point. Uh, you're for it. It's the only way ahead, violence meeting violence. Do you agree? Well, somebody who's sitting on the fence with this one is Tando. Tando, come and tell us what your thoughts are on the uh, violence is sometimes justified proposition. I think violence is sometimes justified because sometimes it's biological. Some people naturally have a bad temper because like, some people obviously have high levels of testosterone in their brains if you do psychology. But then again, it's wrong because if you fight violence, if you fight fire with fire, then you're just going to get more fire and it's not going to resolve an issue. Okay, thank you very much. A moral conundrum for us you're putting there. Um, let's invite Amy to the stage to say why Amy is against. Violence is never the issue. You know, if we are going to be violent, then what example does that set? It just means violence will carry on and carry on and it won't stop. We need to be for people to say, no, this isn't getting anywhere. Let's stop violence and actually sit down and do what we would do anyway and talk. Okay, right, thank you very much. Yep. So we've got four, we've got on the fence, and we've got against. So over to you in the audience, and there's a hand up straight away in the middle there, because we have a microphone to this lady here, and a microphone um, in this lady in the front, so we'll come to her next. So over to you. I think sometimes <coughs> that um, when you do violent things, some innocent people can get hurt. Like, for example, a riot, like, a lot of people got hurt, and they didn't have anything to do with the problem that was being fought against. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you said that we need to all sit down and talk instead of using violence, but what if you're being attacked? You can't talk your way out of it. You will need to defend yourself. Okay, thank you. Let's put the, could we pass it behind you to the lady there? Okay. Thank you. Um, I think that violence is sometimes justified because if you look at Nelson Mandela and if you see the impact that he created on the world, he later became the leader of his country and I think that that's a really good example of how violence is sometimes justified. Okay, thank you. Okay, if you pass it along to the gentleman to your right, lovely. Let's have you. Yep, up you come. Uh, violence is sometimes never needed, but there again, it is sometimes needed, like you said. Uh, an example of this is the Cold War. There were two main oppositions, the US, Russia. Uh, basic morals were being threatened, but the violence of mass nuclear war was even more damaging than the actual violence could have been. And the fear of violence has prevented this war because we both know, we both sides knew what violence could mean for the world as a country. So the fear of violence is sometimes more needed than the actual violence. Um, uh, very interestingly, you know that was called mutually assured destruction. The acronym for that is MAD. 
which is very interesting. That was the mad proposition. But uh, thank you for that comment. We've got a gentleman over here. Uh, yeah, I uh, agree with Amy, as I believe that we do not need violence in today's age to uh, make our message across, and that we have moved at a point in society which violence is not needed, and we could do without it, as the law does help us make our message across without us needed to be violent. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, gentleman at the back, and then lady next to you. Um, I think that I'm kind of on the fence as well. We need, in very necessary situations when we can't speak up for ourselves, we need to stand up for ourselves. We need at least semi violence. But then you get uh, Mahatma Gandhi who tried to promote non violence in a way that everyone would understand. And so he prevented so much violence in the world. Okay, thank you. If you pass it to the lady next to you. In the past, we may have needed violence, but this is the future now. We are much more evolved than we used to be. We don't really need it nowadays when we have all the technology we have. Okay, and the lady next to you. There's a, a whole row of speakers here. Um, over the other side, to be thinking about your comments, we'll be coming to you next. Um, I think violence should be used in a way that could help really change um, someone's point of view because people don't really listen to anyone who's just speaking and saying point. But if you really take action, someone could really listen to you. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll get the microphone uh, to the front here. We'll take another couple of points and then we will come back to our, our main proposition. Again, I do think in this day and age that technology is a great way to actually combat things going on. Like a group of like anonymous, they combat eyes they just through the use of technology. And I also, um, like Mahatma Gandhi, he says something, an eye for an eye makes the world go blind. Okay, and finally on this side, comment here. Uh, violence is not the way. Uh, speaking and love is the way. Speak to the person calmly. There's no point uh, attacking him. Uh, violence is only justified with if someone's attacking you in the country, terrorists, or somebody attacking in the country, then you could show violence. If there's no violence, you could speak someone calmly with them. Okay, right. Let's take, come back to our, our main uh, speakers. We'll come back to the floor. So really keep on thinking about these, uh, these different ideas. You've been pushed a little bit there, Ben. So come and uh, respond to some of the comments you've had, please. With respect to non-violent protests, like with Martin Luther King, he abhorred violence but used it as a useful tool. He used violence against himself with police brutality to raise notion for a cause. If violence can be used effectively like that to raise awareness and to raise support for a cause, is it not, after all, justifiable for those means? Because if the end justifies the means, then who cares what goes on in between? And if you think it on a more biological level with the immune system, the immune system produces an immediate response to any unknown or alien um, antigen or bacteria. And when that is redetected, it will destroy it utterly and completely by flooding your system with an overwhelming force of antigens for that. So if it's un done within our bodies, why can't it be done without our bodies by external bodies to prevent warfare and to prevent discord? Okay. Thank you very much, Ben. And uh, Tando, it seemed to me that quite a few people were in your position of thinking there are sometimes justifications and sometimes not. So, so come and, 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 if you like, take that, uh, that discussion further for us. Well, uh, <laughs> give us an example of when it is OK and when it isn't. Um, I think it's OK, like you said over there, that when someone's attacking you, you can't exactly be like, let's sit down and talk about it, or somebody's attacking your family member, you're not just going to like calmly sit there. First thing you're going to do, like, let's say if a father saw her daughter being attacked, he's not going to like call the police straight away and just sit down and watch it. Obviously, he's going to like act upon it. He's going to probably grab the person off her and probably beat him up or beat her up or whoever's attacking their kid. So that's what I've got to say. Okay, thank you, Tando. And Amy, um, do you make a differentiation in terms of violence, personal violence, as opposed to state violence with your, your proposition? I'd say... Uh, neither personal violence or state violence is right. You know, on a state violence level, after World War II, where for world, across the world we saw many, many horrors, a lot of nations joined together to make the United Nations to protect the world and humanity for future generations. Now, if they've done that for us, why should we not then carry that charter forward to protect the next generation and the generation after that? Recently, we've seen our government take the decision to bomb Syria. This is an act of violence to defend ourselves, as it's been raised by people in the audience. But is that going to solve the problem? 
it's just going to affect innocent people who have done nothing wrong and who are going to now be killed and injured because of our actions, our violent actions that we could have stopped and we've gone over there and we've bombed them and we are no better than ISIS because we are going over there with very little provocation when we're actually not at that much of a risk and we're bombing them. This has been repeated throughout history and eventually it will stop. World War II, World War I were both ended after both sides came together and talked. Its history has shown violence solves nothing talking does. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. And a bit of warmth. There was a bit of warmth in that applause as well, if I'm not wrong. A host of hands have come up. It's a lady here who was ready from before, so let's have you first and then the microphone over, I think, in the front row and then we'll move back. You can't say that violence makes people listen because Nelson Mandela was a pacifist and he didn't use violence and South Africa's apartheid has ended without using violence. Thank you very much. <laughs> Gentleman here. Um, violence plus violence doesn't equal peace. As you said, you can't fight fire with fire, but you have to fight fire with water and that water being compassion and love for love is the only way. Okay, thank you very much. We'll pass the microphone behind you. Behind you, behind you. Over here, if we got someone at the back there, so if we could take the microphone to the back. Yep. Um, you were saying that after World War II, at the end of the day, they just sat down and talked. But these uh, countries or people, they have a mentality where at the beginning, they're not ready to talk. And so they had to go through the process of war and violence to even get them to negotiate. And if you look at the alternatives, it's either you don't do anything to a state or a person who is doing harm and let them carry on. You sit down and talk and most of the time they're not going to listen or you actually intervene and help the person being oppressed. All right, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Gentleman here. Um, someone in the audience had made the comment that um, an action that we can take is violent. However, there are alternatives such as making a petition, getting people together who agree with the viewpoint to... Um, act upon it, have pro protest which do not include violence, strikes, and that could improve like our society. Also, um, I've seen many petitions against uh, um, Prime Minister David Cameron because of what he's done. Even though there's nothing going on and he's not really backing out of his position, um, we don't really, we're not going to have everyone go and just um, attack him or anything. We need to get our whole society together, the people that agree, sign the petition, um, make a campaign and try to do something better for all of us. Okay, thank you. Can we get you to put the microphone over here? And there's a whole row actually who've got their hands up here. So let's uh, stay with this row and then we'll come over here. Uh, well, can we take World War One and World War Two? There were people, there were young innocent men who died for no reason because orders were given which were incorrect. They died without, without even knowing what they were fighting for. They died because they had to. It was obligat obligatory for them to go to war. They had no choice in it. So these, these, these people's lives were lost for no reason. And the issue was resolved without, e without using violence. It was, it was resolved by talking. So can we not just skip, to, skip the, um, the violence and just go straight to the... Um, the like the discussion. The discussion. Yeah, cut out the middleman violence. Move it along, if you would, to the lady in the middle there. Um, and we'll take those a number of comments before we come back here. I think that the end justifying the means can often be a really dangerous view to have because if you look at modern day terrorists, um, they often have a political view or something that they're unhappy with. But, you know, the attention that they get at the end, does that really justify the scaremongering that they, they create in the process? Okay. And pass the microphone along. No, to, uh, well, the lady behind was first and then, and then she'll pass it forward. Um, I understand that violent protests and actions are the loudest and get more attention, but that doesn't make them justifiable. I think the only justifiable acts of violence are those made in defence. Okay, got two more to get to the end of this uh, row who all had their hands up. I'll, I can see other people who are, are, are waiting. We'll come back to you, but let's just finish off this row first. Uh, when we think of violence, we always think about war, terror, but practically we say we're against violence, most of us, but it's kind of hypocrit hypocritical because there's many sports what condone violence. Boxing is a massive one. 
And that's a sport fully based around violence, but it entertains us. However, there are ways to combat this by other sports, what give us the same effect of the need of violence as a biological level, but on a much more safe and moral ground. Okay, get them to, to play a game instead, uh, get some of the aggression out. And finally for the moment, I think talking about an issue rather than using violence is more effective because even though it takes longer, you're not scaring the person person into believing what you want them to believe. Um, what makes you different from terrorists? You, s you say that ends just of, um, yeah, it ju just it's just the means. yeah, um, because they think their view's right and they're saying that they use violence to force you to believe it. And if you're doing the same thing, even though even though you think they're wrong, what makes you different? Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to come back to our, our main protagonists here. Uh, then we'll have one final section. So I know a few people have had hands up. Be ready for, we'll come back to you for the last uh, words on this after we just hear back. Uh, ben, has that changed your mind any? There's quite a few different uh, thoughts and comments there for you. No, and I do get that. But going back to what Amy said about World War, World Wars One and Two, beginning in violence and ending in conversation, it didn't. That's not how those wars ended. World War II end, began with conversations, began with appeasement of Hitler. That was a mistake. And it ended with Hitler's suicide. There was no conversation. There was action. We, it was a decisive victory for Britain over the Third Reich. There was no conversation. OK, well, I'll get you to leave it at that for now. Uh, Amy, do you want to re respond to that? And we'll take you next, and, and then we'll come to Tando. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll respond to Ben's point fair. World War II did end with conversation. The main person, you know, Adolf Hitler committed suicide, but then his second in command spoke to British forces and surrendered. But he had to speak to do that, you know. And this led to the Nuremberg trials, where the... And higher ranking soldiers within the SS, within the Hitler regime, were then brought on trial and faced justice rather than just being killed there and then. You know, and historically, if people in Parliament make the decision, they don't know which families are going to be affected. They don't know the people who are going to go and follow their orders, go abroad to fight these and um, to fight other people and to fight battles that are decided by people who are nicely safe in their nice uh, high buildings in London. You know, I'm going to quote now from Harry Patch, who was the last um, remaining veteran from World War I, when he said, I feel as I felt then, that the people in Parliament should have took guns themselves and solved the battle between them, rather than sanctioning state murder between thousands and thousands of other people. Because they don't know who it's going to affect. We've just started bombing in Syria. We don't know. It's going to likely end up that the airstrikes are not affected, so government will go boots on the ground and that will lead to many more British families, British soldiers having to hear the news that a loved one has been killed because of the government's action. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Tender. I do sort of agree with Amy because look at the police in America, they all carry guns and they use them wrongly. They're killing loads of African Americans as we can see on the news. All they're doing is just basically killing people. That's what I've got to say really. OK. Yeah. Short and sweet. Yeah. There we go. OK, back to our, our um, panel. Uh, thank you very much. And now, finally, to the audience again. This lady is first up, and then if we have the microphone to the front here, and then we'll work our way back. So. so there's been some really, really amazing points made, but I would still have to fundamentally disagree with anyone that would suggest that violence is never justifiable, simply because this is such a sweeping statement to make. Violence exists in so many different forms and happens in so many different situations, not least of all in cases of self-defense and in protests against oppression and atrocities, that it's quite simply naive to dismiss it entirely. Finally, I'd just like to point out that whilst it is unfortunate, it's also undeniable that protests and campaigns that use violence as a tool do receive more recognition. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. yep. um, I think the idea of peace is very idealistic. I mean, history has shown us that countries feel weak and vulnerable when they don't have you know, a great army, when they don't have the, the weapons. I mean... Um, America using Polaris and, um, and Britain using the Blue Streak project as um, a nuclear deterrent shows that countries do fear violence, so they use weapons and stock up their nuclear weapons to 
sort of fight violence. So it, it is needed to stop it all together. Okay, thank you. Do you want to pass it back to in the back row there? One after the other? Two in, the, in the back row first and then we'll come back to you if, if that's okay. Nowadays, we have such things as conscientious objectors in the army and stuff like that. They are people who actually will be in the army but refuse to fight because they don't believe that fighting is the only option. In the past, only, I think it was about 10% of people in World War One and World War Two actually fired their gun and killed someone. Therefore, violence was never the option. Okay, thank you. Um, there's so much violence around the world that just it just keeps on going and keeps on going, but there's so much peace around the world as well. We need to think about this going to uh, even Chinese philosophy, the yin and yang, yin rec uh, representing light, yang representing uh, darkness, and you put them together, light overcomes darkness, it just makes good. We need to think about World War One and World War Two, where people just, people didn't want to fight, they had to. They had no choice. They, no one ever wanted to fight, it just, we don't, we shouldn't cause violence, and that will then prevent violence. Um, going to America, in the 1980s, 1990s with a project MK Ultra, with the mind control and the drugs. And it was violent in a way that we could never understand, but it never should have happened in the first place. Okay, thank you very much. We pass it forward to the gentleman in front of you. Thank you very much. Actions speak louder than words. That may be true, but what is more important, the volume or the message? Violence is very expensive for every everyone who uh, is part of it. Even the ones who are fighting, it's expensive on their lives because they have to pay for their lives because they're at risk. Mm -hmm. Then the ones who are not fighting, they have to pay as well for trillions and trillions of money, doesn't matter what currency, going to spend on wars. And we could use that money on education, on poverty, etc. And also, um, yeah, that's it, sorry. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Is, is there anybody who hasn't spoken who would like to speak on this proposition? Is violence sometimes justified? If you've not spoken already, please put your hand up if you'd like to do a final word. If not, I'm going to invite Ben to come and do a final summation. This is your final opportunity to persuade us that violence is sometimes justified. If we go back to the um, Chinese philosophy of the yin and yang, the representation of balance without the notion of violence, there can never be peace. And without the notion of peace, this whole argument is invalid. So therefore, without violence, it is invalid. So therefore, the justification of this argument justifies war itself, justifies the violence, it justifies everything. And going back to your point about the terrorists having the same end to the end justifying the mean, they will not reach their end because they don't affect the politicians or the political systems they're fighting against. It affects civilians, and they are not a means to an end. They're a means to a bigger war which nobody wants. OK, thank you very much, Ben. Tando, come and persuade us that actually the real position is somewhere in between. I still think that we're in between, because sometimes violence is justified and sometimes it's not. Like somebody said, you can make a lot of noise using violence, like trying to get people's attention and like trying to get people to hear what you're saying. But then again, it's not because with violence, you're just going to cause more violence and it's not going to resolve anything. And then people are going to get hurt in the end. OK, Tando, thank you. And finally, Amy, your final words on the subject. People keep picking up on the fact that violence gets your loud message spread loud and gets your media coverage. But is it for right coverage? If you're violent, you're just given for people you're trying to oppose a brush to tie you with, to sit, get, allow them to say, look, they're being violent. They're obviously folks, we can't listen to them. And it just tires your message and causes your own a uh, problem. If the, I, I won't be able to speak to you after this, this is my last message. But if there's one thing I can ask of you, it's to make sure that we oppose wars, to make sure that we aren't violent in our own lives. Because if we're not violent in our lives, violence won't spread. And hopefully one day we will see violence come to an end. Because nobody wants a war, nobody wants to be violent, and no one wants violence against them. Thank you. And so, there we have it. Coventry, Walsall and Birmingham have spoken. Who won out? Is violence justified? Is it never justified? 
Are there occasions when you can think of it? Well, let's find out what our judge, Craig from Uprising, has to say. Craig, come forward. <laughs> I don't envy you this one. <laughs> um, gosh, again, well done to all speakers. Really compelling debate. Um, well done to everyone as well on the floor. Really good points that were being raised. Re really made really good comments and questions as well. Um, I think for me, there were a range of different techniques that were used throughout this debate, which I really appreciated. So we had people using quotes. Um, we had really informative, high-level um, sort of sharing of knowledge, which I thought was great. We had short, sharp opinions, which was very powerful as well. Um, so it makes it really difficult. And I think for me, in the end, I just look for the person who put the most compelling argument together and who crafted a very convincing and persuasive argument. Um, and this person also had a really nice call to action at the end, which I thought was very powerful. So with that in mind, I think Team Coventry win this debate. Well done. Well done, Team Coventry. Well done, Team Coventry. Well done, Teams Birmingham and Walsall, because there were some fantastic comments in all of those, and, and, and I thought there was quite a split amongst the audience here. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, have a big uh, round of applause for all of you for these Speak for Yourself debates. Well done. Well done. Yeah.